welcome to Healthy Planet, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet on the Think Tech live streaming network series. I'm your host, Dr. Grace O'Neill. Joining me today is Travis Bacon, owner of Hostel Desk. Welcome, Travis. Thank hey, you for being how's it going? On the show. <laughs> hey, how's it going? It's, uh, it's great to be on your show. Thank you. Um, so tell us a little bit about Hostel Desk. So Hustle Till Dusk is a uh, it's a company I started a few weeks ago actually. So it used to be um, under a different name and a different owner. Uh, it used to be two companies or under one entity. One was like the coconut harvesting side, the tree trimming part, and the other part was the market. So I purchased the market side, and then I changed the name Hustle Till Dusk. Um, but I've been doing the farmers markets, these particular farmers markets for about nine months now. But in general, I've been cutting coconuts since 20, early 2015. So tell us about how you got interested in coconuts specifically. So I, I've been on this aisle my whole life. I'm from Haula, North Shore area, and I've just been surrounded by coconuts my whole life, yet I've up until I was 20, 22 or 23, I had never actually had a real coconut. Like my association with coconut was um, like, you know, the canned coconut water or like the fake uh, shavings of a coconut, like the artificially flavored stuff. So I tried that and I never really liked it. And then one day I was uh, walking around Haleiwa and I saw one of my friends from high school, uh, he was running a coconut stand. He was like husking it with a big spike and serving customers. And I just stopped by just to like, you know, say what's up to him. And then it, it was right then and there that he gave me a coconut to try. And it was unlike anything I've ever had. Like the actual canned coconut or the artificial flavors, just it couldn't compare. And it was at that moment, I, you know, it was kind of life changing for me because it led to the trajectory that led to me owning this business and doing it for a little over eight years now. That's great. Um, I was wondering, like, with the coconuts that you sell, I mean, obviously they're fresh, but maybe people don't know the difference between getting a canned coconut. Um, drink versus like a bottle coconut drink i mean i see some of them um there's that one harmless harvest and they're pink like why are those pink versus yours that are um you know the fresh coconuts they're not pink um to be honest i'm not a hundred percent sure i actually did have this conversation with somebody who knew a little bit more in depth about why they were uh turning pink i think part of it has to do with like the um, exposure to oxygen or at least the bottling process. Um, I think it may also have to do with the, the geology, like where the coconuts are from. Um, in my experience, like I've only dealt with coconuts from Oahu and some, sometimes a big island, but in general, just Hawaiian coconuts. And out of all the coconuts I've ever husked in my life, there has been three times where I've encountered um, this this pink uh, coloration, um, and the water, like when I when I bottled it or like you know flipped it over into a cup, um, the cup was transparent. I could see like a little tinge of pink, but it was a lot more subtle compared to um, the harmless harvest, um, more saturated pink. Yeah, I always kind of wonder, um, I, they say it's not a big deal, but I just think it's kind of, it's it's weird that, you know, when you get a coconut, uh, you know, coconut water from an actual coconut, it's never that color. So I feel a little bit suspicious, you know. Um, yeah, yeah, I, 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 I share that sentiment as well. And I, yeah. you know, that's not to, uh, not to knock the Harmless Harvest brand either, but uh, some, some coconut water, I feel like, um, even the ones without the no sugar added, it it's a little like overly sweet. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, like, with the um, coconuts, you know, there's different um, ages, like, to the coconut um, 
you know, what, once it, it's picked from the tree and everything. So um, if you wanted to get, um, I know if you wanted to get more water and less meat, you go for a certain age. And then if you want to get more meat and like, so what's the difference? And is one, is it older coconut sweeter or younger coconut? Do you have any tips for people? Yeah, so it, it's, um, it's not very linear. Um, I like to compare coconuts to uh, people as far as like the way they age. Um, so you have like the, you know, a lot of people thinking like new or like old coconut or like young coconut. To me, there's like different stages. So when a coconut first grows on the tree, it starts off with all water and no meat. And right when it's starting to fruit, it'll be like a very small coconut. Um, and of course, it eventually grows bigger. But, you know, the growing process for all coconuts, you know, they, they take all kinds of shapes and sizes. But there is a certain threshold where once it is like a certain size, it's like not quite uh, mature enough to gain the meat. But when it is, uh, it gains the meat and it starts off with a jelly-like consistency. And a lot of people call this the, the spoon meat for, uh, because, you know, you can pretty much take a spoon to it, go against like the, the edge of it and pretty much eat it from there. And then as it ages, um, it the, the, sorry, excuse me, the meat becomes a little bit more firm. Uh, after the jelly, like it, it's still pretty soft, still soft enough to use a spoon on, but then it eventually becomes chewier and chewier. And I like to classify those stages as like the baby coconuts and then the teenage coconuts. And then, then you have like what's um, basically like a medium. So during these stages, with the exception of the baby phase, when when it doesn't have any meat, uh, the sweetness or the level, the amount of sugar or levels of sweetness, however you, you wish to call it, uh, it kind of goes, it kind of peaks. And then right at the medium stage, it stays that level of sweetness. And it's at the medium stage that something interesting begins to happen. It's not like a guaranteed thing. It's kind of a dice roll. But some coconuts gain like a carbonation. And some people call this like the champagne coconut, the pretty called like something akin to Sprite. And it has like that little natural carbonation. Uh, it's usually at that stage when it's like a medium where the meat is not neither soft nor hard. And but it still has that sweetness to it. And then after that is when the, the meat starts to get thicker and thicker and the water, uh, it loses, I don't know if it actually like loses electrolyte content or it's converted into antioxidants, but it does gain like more antioxidants. And this may not be the correct term, but when a, at past a certain stage of maturity, it, um, kind of goes through something like fermentation. It's still, you can still drink it. It just doesn't have that sweetness that coconut water is, you know, renowned for. Um, then at, at the most mature stages, we have coconuts that we call shakers. And they, we call them that because uh, all the other stages, previous stages of coconuts, they're filled to the brim with water. Like there's, you know, it's, pressure like highly pressurized like when i like go through it with a machete sometimes like there'll be like a jet stream of coconut water that launches just because of the peer pressure and we call uh the, old, the older coconuts we call them shakers because they don't have this you know you could take it to your ear and shake it and you can hear the water rustle around uh, those are the coconuts that um i like to use for uh selling the meat or or harvesting the meat out of it um it, because there's a there's a lot of it so coconuts have like this balancing balancing act the coconuts that don't have a lot of meat will have a lot of water the coconuts that don't have a lot of water will have a lot of meat yeah so um i'm wondering once a coconut turns to like a brown almost wooden texture is it basically over for the coconut in terms of meat and water um you'd be surprised 
so the the older coconuts um once it's off the tree it doesn't gain any more maturity so depending on like when you harvest the coconut the younger coconuts have a shorter shelf life so in general i tell people like the coconuts i sell like they probably have a shelf life from like anywhere ranging between like four days to two weeks and then the old the older coconuts the ones you see at the supermarket whether they're husked or not those actually stay on on the shelves for months and months um when i was living in washington temporarily i worked at a grocery store and we had coconuts on the on the shelves and i i happened to be working the produce section so i'd be in charge of like you know ch you know quality control and whatnot and since I already had previous experience with coconuts, you know, I would open these ones with a hammer and um, they're not they're not the best kinds of coconuts for the water, uh, but they do have the longest shelf life, hence why um, they can ship internationally. Mostly, yeah. Most of, yeah, mostly from like Thailand, Vietnam, the Philippines. Yeah. It's really, you can't really do that with the young coconut water. Yeah. So these coconuts we have in Hawaii, where are they originally from? Are they from the South Pacific originally? Do you have any idea? Um, as far as the origin? Yeah, like the trees that are going. I'm assuming the Polynesians um brought them from where they were from and they were native there, but I'm I don't know if they're native here. I mean no idea. I, I I feel like they've kind of always been around in any tropical environment because that's mm -hmm. where they thrive they thrive the most like in areas where it's basically um arid or dry it's nearly impossible to grow a coconut tree so I think it requires like some kind of mo moisture that both in the soil and in the air I know mm -hmm. some cultures have called um coconut coconut water as uh the sky water since you know it grows up in tall trees but then you also do have like the um the samoan coconuts where uh or the samoan coconut trees where it's a short tree and you could pretty much just like stand there and grab them yourself they're at mm -hmm. they're at pretty much at eye level and how do you know like when you're looking at a tree how do you know the coconut is ready to be grabbed? It's a certain size oh. you see. Yeah, size is a factor, but only up to a certain point. Um, it's hard to describe in words, but there is there are elements of its shape that can give you an indicator of you know how ripe or um, what it what level its maturity is at. Uh, mm -hmm. So on the on one side where the coconut grows, you have the branch and then the crown where uh, the coconut kind of hangs. And then on the opposite side, you have what what I call the three crowns, basically like the pointed edges. And the more pronounced these edges are, generally the the more mature the coconut is. So wow. the older coconuts will have like a more pronounced. Um, it. I guess the uh, pointed edges. Um, those are the same ones that when I cut, I start with by cutting those three, and then I cut around it. Uh, the the part, the crown where it grows is where I cut the flat base, so that way it can stand on a table. Um, pretty much the whole time at at the farmers market, uh, that machete right there is called a kukri. And right now I'm cutting the flat base, and I moved on to cutting the the three prongs and all around it. That's the part where I open it up, and basically I rinse and repeat this process anywhere between 150 to 200 times per market. And this is how um, I make it accessible to the customer. That's great. And what farmers markets are you at, so people know? Uh, we are at Kaka'ako um, with the food trucks at the Hakuone Harbor uh, from 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. every Saturday. And then Kailua right across from Castle Hospital, uh, same time, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. 
Um, so right now it's every Saturday or Sunday. I'm eventually going to do more markets and try to cover more more of the island on more days. But for now, those that's those are the days where we are present. Great. Can you show us some more pictures, Michael, that he sent us? So this is your stand at the farmer's market with the coconuts, correct? Let's see. And uh, can go on. This is during Christmas, you said, correct? Yeah. So this is around Christmas time. We try to we try our best to do like little decorations for for seasonal. Um, yeah, this is around Christmas time, and the great thing about coconuts is that they're year round, so it's uh it's not seasonal like mangoes. So do you take the um the coconut waste back with you, like if someone finishes the water and they don't want the meat? Okay, so when they bring back um, their coconut after they're done drinking it, we crack it open for them. I cut it in half, and then we have uh, specialized tools to scoop the meat out. But if it's something like a like a spoon meat, sometimes I'll even like create a spoon from the coconut husk and serve it to them like that. And uh, nice. yeah, we try to we try to eliminate waste. We try to make use of every part of the coconut, even even the husk or the the shell that otherwise people would otherwise think is uh, useless. Can you explain that to us what this picture is, the last picture they showed us with the truck, um, where you dumped off the waste? So this is uh, one of the farms I took it to. Uh, I basically, they basically asked that I just like pile it up and we eventually like, there's much more than that. We eventually like spread it out across the tarp uh, what this farm is going to do with it is create biochar, which is a, I, I suppose, a form of charcoal. And they, I don't know all the ins and outs and all the science behind it, but in layman's terms, the way it was described is that it's like a form of charcoal created from the coconut shell, the part between the coconut husk and the coconut meat. And the husk is very flammable once it's dried up. So that acts as a fire starter. And what they do is they're, they're gonna contain um, all the refuse. And eventually the fire is going to consolidate all the matter, particularly from the coconut shell into what is called biochar. And you have another farm too that you give some of the refuse to as well, correct? Yes. Yes, so there's another farm I take it to, and they I give it to somebody who grows vanilla, and this is a little different. It's actually unlike anything I've I've ever seen. But he has a vanilla greenhouse, and he uh basically like you know potted plants and the the vanilla roots grow around um, wire and other other parts of the setup in order to make it most efficient. What he does with the coconut husk is uh, he puts it around on the bottom of the potted of the plastic bins and this allows the roots to grow around it or inside the coconut husk so the coconut husk acts as a microclimate mm. because it blocks out the sunlight and absorbs the humidity and it actually gives um the vanilla plant um more life it provides by blocking off some of the elements that would otherwise be very difficult to block out, even in a greenhouse setting. That's great. I mean, how about if somebody, I mean, I'm assuming you have plenty of coconut waste. So if somebody wanted to keep their own husk waste, they could make cocoa core, is that correct? Like, would you just- Oh, absolutely. So, absolutely. Yeah. So it also has, um, you can also use it for like fertilizer. Mm -hmm. I've, I've heard of people like, letting it dry out. I think letting it dry out and lose the moisture is pretty key um, for whatever your purposes are with it. Uh, I've heard of them letting it dry out and running it through a wood chipper to make get like the strands and eventually like something close to like a powder or like sawdust. And then yeah, it, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah apparently that's like a very nutritious, um, nutritious for the soil uh, fertilizer. Yeah, no, I've I've seen I don't know I've saw videos online where 
somebody took all the cocoa, um, you know, the, the little shreds, like the hairs, and they let it dry out. They put it in like a blender or food processor, and then they just chop into little pieces and it becomes cocoa core. Um, so I thought that was pretty cool because you could grow a lot of things from cocoa core. It's a great seed starter. So it's using like the whole part of the coconut, you know. Um, do you make coconut bowls? I know you said you make a spoon from the coconut. Do you also do the bowls? Because I know there's some merchants that are selling coconut bowls. I have some. Um, that that is actually something I've um I've actually done before. So there's two different methods of husking a coconut. There's one you saw in the previous video where you're just kind of hacking away at a machete, and then there's another way where you kind of you take something sharp like I used to use a big spike in the ground that curves at 45 degree angles and I basically like slam the coconut against it and it would separate the husk from the shell and then I could just like rip it off and then going around until it's all off what this does it basically separates the husk from the nut entirely so you get to see the entire thing rather than just like partial husk cut off and from there you can open it uh, with something more about blunt force so i use like the back side of the machete and then i open it and it almost like cracks open in, like a perfect path so after scooping the meat uh, i used to collect these bowls and just like sand it down you know make it smooth and even uh cover it in resin it's mm -hmm. it's a pretty laborious process when you consider you know everything that came before it in order to get it to that point um yeah, yeah it's something it I, th I think they're really cool. So mm -hmm. the nut is more more circular, whereas like the husk kind of makes it into um, more a more cylindrical shape generally. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's like it's really really amazing like what Mother Nature can produce. Oh yeah, the, you can make bowls from coconuts. It's phenomenal. I'm wondering um, if someone doesn't happen to have a machete at home or they're afraid to use a machete for fear they might cut themselves, is there another mm -hmm. tool you would suggest that somebody open a coconut with? Like how can they yeah. open it with simple kitchen tools at home? Oh, that's a tough one. Um, generally something like sharp and a certain weight, like just, just enough weight to uh, put force behind it um generally when i'm like cutting coconuts at the farmer's market i will if i do see kids around you know i will advise them not to try it at home uh i've heard of people like kind of like throwing it against a rock in order to uh, crack it open but that's pretty in inefficient um because when a coconut falls from a tree or is like thrown against something once it cracks internally like the water starts leaking out um Generally, it's just a very, it can be very dangerous. Um, mm -hmm. I, during my early years, I definitely had like a few cuts here, here and there. And um, it's, I would say, just find somebody who, who knows what they're doing with the machete. Um, it's, it's something that I would, it, it can be a pretty dangerous process. So I, I would not recommend recommend it to somebody who doesn't, you know, have at least some experience or know what they're doing with the coconut. That's particularly why I believe that it's so. It contributes to why it's such a desired and valuable substance, is that it's the coconuts are everywhere, but in order to harvest what's inside of it, you have to put in all put in work. And so um, with the um, coconuts, I suppose like you um, wanted to sprout your own coconut. Any advice on that? Um, your own I'm, I'm, actually in the, I'm actually in the process of doing that myself. I would say like get a really old coconut, like the shakers, mm -hmm. and they kind of germinate on their own. Like in, you just put it in like moist, mainly like kind of like a swamp lake. A uh, mixture of like water and grass. You don't even have to put it like under under soil. Um, you just let it germinate from there, and eventually it'll sprout. And whether or not this 
there, there is like a type of edible coconut called the sprouted coconut. It's like a angel food cake on the inside. Those are pretty rare. They're very hard to cultivate. And that whole process of even like having it sprout can take anywhere from like a couple of weeks to a couple of months. Mm -hmm. it's, and I, then, I, go ahead. I, sorry, I just believe it's all about uh, patience since even growing a coconut tree can take 10 years before it starts fruiting. Mm -hmm. But it's so worth it. I mean, how many fruits does a coconut tree give a year once it's mature after 10 years? Any idea? I, I estimate between 20 to 120. Um, yeah, I don't climb the trees so much anymore, but when I used to climb them back in like 2015, 2016, uh, that would be like the reasonable range. That being said, you know, I've seen trees with only eight coconuts and I've seen trees with like close to 200. Yeah. So um, where do you guys get your coconuts then if you're not uh, climbing the trees anymore? Um, as of right now, I buy them wholesale and I get it from my old, um, my current source is also the source I've been getting it from for these farmers markets. They trim residential properties around Kailua and Waimanalo but also occasionally like other areas, but primarily based in the Waimanalo, Kailua area. That's great. So um, th what would they do with the coconuts otherwise? Would they just try to sell them like whole like that or? Um, it's a good question. It's kind of like a case by case basis. Uh, a lot uh -huh. of, sometimes uh, they trim the trees mainly to prevent ha hazards. So falling coconut uh, at terminal <laughs> velocity, um, coconuts yeah. actually, yeah, yeah, they kill more people <laughs> per year than sharks. Wow, that's for all the shark haters out there. <laughs> yeah. Okay. We're out of time, so we have to wrap it up, unfortunately. But um, thank you, Travis, for being on the show, and hopefully, people can check you out at um hus and hustle us at the farmers market. Um, I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. This is Healthy Planet on the Think Tech Live Streaming Network series. We've been talking with Travis Bacon, owner of Hustle Desk. Thanks to Michael, our broadcast engineer, and the rest of the crew at Think Tech for hosting our show. And thanks to you, our listeners, for listening. I'll see you in two weeks for more of Healthy Planet on Think Tech, the show for people who care about their health and the health of our planet. My next guest will be Matt Feldman, founder of Moku Foods. We will be talking about mushroom jerky. If you have ideas for the show or questions for my future show guests, please contact me at healthyplanetthinktech at gmail.com. Check out my website at graceinhawaii.com or Instagram at gracefulliving365 for more information on my projects, including future show guests. I'm Dr. Grace O'Neill. Aloha, everyone. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.